Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thanks so much. I'm uh, pleased to be with you guys today. Thanks so much for uh, in inviting me and, uh, and especially for bearing with me uh, over Skype. Uh, it, it's a uh, amazing, strange technology to be able to see you and in uh, chat with you like this. So uh, this is uh, oh hello everyone. Uh, so this is this is the a book that I've spent uh, the last five years writing. That when I started it in 2010, the idea of Russia and nuclear war both seemed like they were topics for a history book. And then when the book came out last year, it just turned out to be much more of a how-to manual than I had originally intended uh, this history of the U.S. government's doomsday plans from the Cold War. This is uh, the history of a series of strange plans and vehicles and secret facilities that the U.S. government built up over the first of the Cold War that's collectively known as the Continuity of Government Programs, the COG plans. And I was a reporter in Washington covering national security, and it sort of bumped up against these plans over and over again. Uh, uh, talking to people who had been evacuated to some of these mountain bunkers like Raven Rock and Mount Weather in Maryville, Virginia, uh, on 9-11, people who had been part of these plans during the Bush and Obama years. Uh, and then I actually at one point flew with the first helicopter squadron, the Air Force's uh, secret unit that is in charge of evacuating VIPs from Washington on, uh, on in the event of a catastrophic attack on the Capitol. But then really got me interested in this book was I had this uh, strange experience. I was working at Washingtonian Magazine at the time and one of my colleagues brought in the, uh, the badge of a U.S. intelligence officer that he found on the floor of a commuter parking garage on his way into work. And he said, uh, he said, you know, you cover this stuff. I'll bet you can figure out how to get this badge back to this guy. I'll bet he had a really bad day when he got to the office and discovered he didn't have his ID badge to get into the get into work. And uh, so uh, I started looking at the, the badge and flipped it over. And on the back, it had this set of driving directions, this set of evacuation directions. And so being the nosy reporter that I am, I got on the Google map, Google satellite, and started following these driving directions out through, uh, out of DC into Virginia and then ultimately in West Virginia. And found uh, that they led to the side of a mountain in West Virginia, this totally unmarked mountain in West Virginia, where you could see on the Google satellite, the roads started to go up the hill, and then there was a guard shack and a chain link fence, and then about 50 yards further up the road, the road just disappeared into the side of a mountain with these big concrete glass bunker doors. And I was like, wow, this is one of the new facilities that have grown up since 9-11 that, uh, that are part of these continuity of government plans that no one has heard about. And so I ended up going back and trying to figure out where these plans started and how they got going. And what it turns out to be is this much more interesting history than I had even imagined about how nuclear weapons transformed the American presidency, that what uh, sort of forget today is that so much of the apparatus that surrounds the presidency, sort of all of these fancy toys that we think of as the majestic imperial presidency, Air Force One, Marine One, Harvard Hurricane, are really tools that grew up during the Cold War to ensure that the President of the United States, wherever he is, can launch nuclear weapons from anywhere on the surface of the planet. And that, it, it, that this collapsed the time and space around the presidency in a way that was unprecedented for American history. I mean, 
doing this late as 1935 when FDR went to the dedication of the Hoover Dam. His motorcade got lost in the canyons on the drive back to Las Vegas, and the President of the United States just disappeared for the afternoon. No one knew where he was, when he was going to pop up, uh, or even sort of where he might next appear. Was it going to be in Nevada? Was it going to be in Utah? Was it going to be in Arizona? Uh, you know, it was just, he was just gone. And as late as January 1935, when Harry Truman took as vice president, the vice president of the United States didn't even have secret service that the vice president sort of wandered around Washington uh, unmolested and unnoticed uh, on a daily basis with sort of the expectation that as long as you could sort of get in touch with the vice president, you know, within a couple of hours or maybe by the next day, like, who could imagine needing a vice president more quickly than that? And then, of course, by that summer, you have the arrival of the atomic bomb. And that begins this the change in the presidency. That, both in the apparatus around the president, the arrival of these new communication tools, as well as sort of a fundamental change in the way we think of presidency. Um, and most of us think of the president as the person that we elect on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November every four years. But what we sort of don't realize is that under the 25th Amendment, the, which guides presidential succession, which was a invention of the Cold War, a, a, a need to ensure that there was always someone ready to step into the presidency. That there, the office of president today actually in, involves hundreds of people. That you have not just sort of the succession plan that we know, you know, president, vice president, speaker of the house, president pro tem of the senate, and then the cabinet officials. But then each of those cabinet officials has their own line of succession to ensure that none of the cabinet posts is ever vacant. Such that after a catastrophic surprise attack on Washington, you would have this incredibly strange and to most Americans surprising set of people who use themselves as the new leaders of the United States. Uh, people like the UN ambassador. Uh, he, uh, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Texas, uh, the top federal prosecutor for North Texas, uh, would become one of the highest ranking government officials in the United States, along with the director of the Department of Energy's Savannah River Operations Center in Georgia, uh, who would suddenly be the highest ranking Department of Energy employee outside of Washington. And so you would sort of suddenly have this cabinet and the presidency reconstituted all of the people that we'd be very surprised as Americans to suddenly realize are our leaders. And that that was very much a conscious decision of the Cold War uh, after reason through the 1950s and 1960s that the presidency looked for, for the vice presidency to be vacant any longer. That actually, for the first 150 years of American history, the vice presidency was vacant for more than 40 years. That there was no one in mind after the president. Uh, and that we sort of amazing made it through that era without ever suffering a presidential catastrophe that would have left the nation without a leader, but that that was not a reality that we could face in the Cold War, and certainly not under the ear trigger alerts necessary for the Cold War nuclear era. And that this was also sort of a moment that really transformed American society. Um, some of you uh, of a certain generation will remember uh, sort of an era when nuclear war was a much more regular part of daily American life, uh, sort of the duck and cup drills, 
with ritual, the animations with Bert the Turtle showing you how to crawl under your elementary school desk to ensure that you were just low enough under the desk to survive the atomic bomb. And that we saw practically the entire country in the 1950s run these massive uh, outrageous alerts, these three or four day annual summer exercises where the president and cabinet and the leaders of Pentagon would retreat out in bunkers and run government from the hills. That in New York City, both full scale uh, all out shelter evacuations where the stock market would shut down, the buses would stop the streets and make passengers run to nearby all out shelters. That even uh, in New York City, they distributed dog tags to students to help them uh, survive emergency. And in Chicago, the Chicago school system recommended the parents tattoo their child's blood type on their torso, not an arm or a leg, which could be blown off at the explosion, but in the, on the torso to help speed the blood transfusions that would be necessary after surviving direct attack. That this was an era when the government sort of created this whole strange post-apocalypse version of itself, sort of the analog of the peacetime government in ways that seem almost unimaginable to us. Parents would get from their kids brochures like this about uh, how to prepare for the emergency, what radio station to tune into uh, for civil defense notices. And that then you would flee down into the government prepared fallout shelters. I'll, uh, I would bet that many of you sort of still recognize and can spot that yellow and black fallout shelter sign on elementary schools and post offices that you see sort of rusting away today, but during the Cold War meant that in that basement there were these pre-stock supplies of biscuits and sanitation facilities, clean water, uh, that the government sort of came up with this free red heat for these survival biscuits that were going to be the food that all of America would live through the hot lips eating, that they were uh, manufactured by the Bisco and Kroger, 160 million tons of biscuits and distributed to fallout shelters across the country such that in the fallout shelter you would be given six crackers per day, 125 calories a piece, sort of survival, starvation level rations to get you through the two weeks of living in the fallout shelters. The brochure that came with the biscuits sort of loved this idea of the government worker who sat down to write a brochure on how to eat the biscuit. But the, the brochure says that you should spread out the biscuits into six separate meals over the course of the day because there's so little to do in a fallout shelter that you want to maximize the entertainment of eating. And Afterwards, you would flee from the fallout shelters out into refugee camp run by the National Park Service. The thinking being that the national parks would be largely untouched by nuclear war, and so your friendly neighborhood park rangers would spend the two weeks setting up refugee camps in, inside your closest uh, untouched national parks. And there, you would be able to drive this form 8.0 post office, the safety notification card, where you would fill out the your name and the names of the family members that you went uh, and survived nuclear war with, and then you would address it to someone else that you wanted to tell that you could survive. These cards pre-printed and pre-located at post offices around the country. And then the post office would assemble all of these cards and figure out sort of who was left behind and who had, uh, and, and register the dead in nuclear war. Because the post office, of course, the agencies and the government had the 
best records of who lived where. So uh, the good news uh, for those of you as you sort of plan your modern day bug out bags is that no post-it is necessary for things you see are. And post-it requirements were uh, suspended in the wake of nuclear war. So you can take the forever stamps out of your bug out bags. And that then the cutting would would turn this weird set of nationalized industries, these secret government guards were appointed by President Eisenhower to uh, lead the, the nationalized manufacturing sector, nationalized transportation sector, to set weakness and prices and rations for the entire country. There were nine different men that Eisenhower pulled from the private sector and gave free written uh, government authorizations declaring them effectively the, the czars of their respective industries under martial law to be declared in the wake of nuclear war. And that this would be sort of the way that America began to rebuild in the wake of nuclear war. The government leaders, of course, would retreat to their own mountain bunker, places like Raven Rock uh, near New Orleans, in Lancaster, in Maryville, Virginia, or sorry, uh, uh, in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, and then Mount Feather uh, in Maryville, Virginia, the president bunker, even Rock being bunker for the Pentagon. And the scale of these facilities are almost unimaginable to us, uh, particularly in that they still are running today, that these facilities still are staffed 24 hours a day, people waiting there in case of a surprise nuclear attack uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the Raven Rock Mount Weather, the NORAD facility in Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado Springs, uh, these massive underground cities with pre-standing buildings built inside of a hollowed out mountain, uh, capable of holding a thousand people of peace inside the mountain with reservoirs, medical facilities, police departments, fire departments, generating plants, sort of everything that you could imagine needing to run the U.S. government. And that these plants, uh, beyond those two major facilities, have built more than a hundred of these government bunkers around the country. Uh, FEMA, the agency responsible for planning most of these post-apocalypse uh, emergency plans uh, had bunkers in places like Baker, Massachusetts, Denton, Texas, Thomasville, Georgia, Colorado, Bethel, Washington. And then the facilities uh, even included, for instance, like the, the Federal Reserve uh, built a bunker inside Mount Pony, Virginia, that had room not just for the Fed chair and the board of governors, but also $2 billion in cash, uh, which was anticipated to be America's currency needs for the 18 months that it would take the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to begin printing currency again. Now, sort of one of the weird quirks in the way the government made these decisions was that after their war, most of us would be spending $2 bills that would, if you remember in the 1970s when the government reintroduced the Thomas Jefferson $2 bill, it turned out no one in America wanted to use a $2 bill. And so instead of pulping all of the ones that they printed, they shrink wrapped them and stuck them in the Mount Pony, <laughs> assuming that after the click war, we would all be less choosy about what currency we're willing to use. <laughs> and that this, uh, these bunkers and, and sort of secret relocation plants existed uh, for almost every federal agency spread across sort of Pennsylvania uh, and uh, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, and then down into North Carolina. And even uh, sort of part of interesting about this is the way that this history of choosing what to preserve and what 
survive nuclear war very quickly becomes this very existential question about what America actually is. Are you trying to preserve the presidency? Are you trying to preserve the branches of government? Or are you trying to preserve the historical totem that bound us together by generation? And so at the National Archives, they came up with a ranked list and order that they would evacuate first the Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution. Uh, then at the Library of Congress, they had plans that they would evacuate the Gettysburg Address before George Washington's military commission. The National Gallery of Art had a ranked order of the paintings and how uh, and how and in which order most valuable paintings would be ushered away to nuclear bunkers. And then in front of one of my favorite details in the entire book is the story of the specially trained team of park rangers in Philadelphia who, through the Cold War, had the job of evacuating the Liberty Bell in the event of a surprise Soviet attack. Uh, and I just kind of have this like mental picture of these park rangers driving off with the Liberty Bell in the back of their pickup truck, swinging off to one of these bunkers and getting there and being like, no, 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 we swear the crack was there before we left Philadelphia. <laughs> And this, this sort of becomes this entire shadow government uh, hidden away in these bunkers uh, and, and hidden away in command posts that most of us never realized was taking place. That wasn't just underground, but was also at sea and up in the air. That through the 1960s and the early 1970s, there were special Navy ships, the presidential emergency command posts afloat, the USS Wright and the USS Northampton, one of which was always kept on station off the Atlantic coast, ready to receive the president in the event of an evacuation from Washington. Sort of fun little fact. Bob Woodward, the Watergate journalist, actually did his Navy service as one of the nuclear emergency action officers aboard those presidential command uh, ships. And so if you were Lyndon Johnson and had launched nuclear war, uh, you would have met Bob Woodward on the ship to tell you how to launch the nation's weapons. Then we also had a fleet of presidential emergency uh, airborne command posts the doomsday planes. These planes actually still exist, still operational today, converted Boeing 747s uh, that are sitting alert at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. One of these planes has been kept steadily on alert since uh, the 1960s, 747s came into operation in the 1970s and continue to sit alert today. Uh, as we are talking today on a random Wednesday in February, one of these presidential doomsday planes, codenamed Nightwatch, is sitting on the runway at Offutt or at Wright-Patterson. Its engines are turning, it is fully staffed, and could launch in less than 15 minutes to rendezvous the president wherever he is and lead nuclear war from the sky for up to three days or it would be forced to land. Beyond the presidential doomsday plane from 1962 until 1992, we kept a plane codenamed King Glass in the sky 24 hours a day, 360 five days a year for 30 years flying over planes with a one-star general sitting inside whose job it was everyone on the surface of the United States was killed. The general plane could still launch the submarine missiles and individually launch every ICM that had survived nuclear war. That this was the ultimate sort of last resort for the United States is the, the general looking class plane.
flying eight and a half hour shifts, three shifts per day, 24 hours a day for 30 years. That much of this apparatus, as I said, sort of still exists today with these special bunkers uh, still operational. Um, and, and that much of it is wrapped out into public view. Um, uh, as, the, uh, as you heard earlier, sort of Raven Rock started as this incredible secret. Uh, and now is a little bit more publicly identified today. Um, the, uh, and, but the, you know, for, there are still people who wake up every day in America and go to work in these bunkers ready for the catastrophe. Um, and, and then it's sort of, in many ways, these bunkers, as strange and surreal as they are, uh, are just regular government jobs. Uh, the, the Raven Rock Bunker, uh, has a uh, its cafeteria is run by the Choctaw Indian tribe as part of the government uh, minority contracting rules. At Cheyenne Mountain, this is the bunker that some may be familiar with from the movie Porky, Matthew Broderick. The cafeteria there now has a Subway fast food franchise. <laughs> that, uh, there's at least one fast food worker in America who will survive the war. And he's sitting there making oh, $5 footlongs for all of the Air Force uh, who happen to be on ship during that eight hour window when nuclear war acts unfolds. So, um, I think we have about 15 minutes left here, so I'd love to sort of, there, you know, there's a thousand different directions you can sort of go here, um, and would love to take some questions and sort of talk a little bit more about this incredibly strange world uh, of where we would go uh, and what would happen to the United States after a catastrophe.